Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk about architecting and building a data lake on GCP with open source tools. My name is Roderick Liao. I'm a cloud data engineer at Google Professional Services. So we help our most strategic customers migrate into GCP and take most advantage of GCP. Um, I work with many of the customers across many industries, from marketing, retail, technology, to financial services. So Hadoop data lakes today are the most common ones that is on-prem. Um, so most of our enterprise customers are moving Hadoop to GCP, and the trend is accelerating. So today I'll walk you through how to architect and build data lakes on GCP, and what principles, tools, and patterns that you should choose to build data lakes. On top of that, um, it is important to know how to secure and govern a data lake. So why should I run data lakes on GCP? So there are many challenges to gain value out of the on-premise data lakes today. Um, the total cost of ownership is very high, um, higher than expected. There are many hidden costs. Uh, it's hard to project. It's hard to scale, although Hadoop is also built on the principle of scale. Um, governance and security usually is an afterthought and management burdens are high on the teams. The admin teams are struggling with many tasks such as tuning or scaling or resource allocation, or guiding the application teams, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. So by moving data lakes to cloud, you can extend existing investments. Um, in on-premise environment, the cluster size is almost fixed tuned for maximum capacity. In cloud, you have the chance to optimize for the cost by spinning up and down clusters and configuring them separately. So also in the cloud, um, you can scale easily, no more take months to get the capacity you need. Um, by moving some of the work to manage components, it can help reduce workload for your big data team and let users focus on add more values more directly. Um, by utilizing more of the integrated tools and the existing patterns, enable democratization and let more teams to get access to the data they need. And finally, by running more um, workloads on natively built tools and platform, uh, your team can develop things quicker and requires less maintenance and more connected through the GCP platform. So let's talk about how to design and migrating data lakes to GCP. Um, because we're talking about mostly Hadoop data lakes for the on-prem customer, um, that's what uh, we most guide our customers for. Um, there are many tools to choose from to build a data lake. For example, these are just the data analytics product and, and the GCP. Um, I will walk you through how to choose and build a data lake using these tools and, um, and also the tools of your choice, of course. Our guiding principles here are open, integrated, and safe. So open to many open source big data tools and file formats out of the box, avoiding lock-ins and creating another silo. Um, we want to make sure that data lakes more connected to the other tools and capacities, such as Apache Spark, Hive, TensorFlow, and various uh, GCP, ML, AI, API, et etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, the third is safe, safe to migrate without having to make risky decisions while getting benefit from the cloud. A couple of key considerations when you uh, migrating stuff, when you're planning. So be clear about your near-term and long-term goals and priorities. For example, if your data center lease is ending in two months, your goal should probably get your data center uh, or get your clusters out of there as soon as possible rather than uh, making significant architecture changes along the way. The best way to utilize GCP is to choose the right tool for the workload instead of finding just the replacement tool for every tool you have today. Um, it is best to utilize GCS to separate storage and compute. This will enable you to use more ephemeral clouds or other type of cloud storage pattern to lower cost, uh, improve performance, and scale better. Um, the last is you need to rethink about your operations. Um, you will use a bunch of uh, different types of cluster and services. The old on-premise uh, management tools such as Apache and Bari just wouldn't help in that case. Um, you wanna make your infrastructure and application de developments as code um, so your application teams can deploy them because they know it better. Um, most of the customers choose to use Apache Airflow or Cloud Composer to run their platforms. Um, Airflow packages most of the operations that you need to interact with the cloud providers' products into a different Airflow operators. Um, too many cluster creation and deletion could result in higher overhead. For example, jobs could take um, a little bit longer to get started and shut it down. 
So pulling the cluster together and let a middle layer to um, choose a less utilized cluster is a good idea. Uh, so there are, there are some tools out there. For example, Spotify creates um, an open source tool called Spidera. Um, it's available on GitHub. So let's take a look at the usual workload patterns. We generally have these four types of workload. It is best to know um, what type of workloads that you're running. So these profiles and patterns will help you choose which GCP tool to use and what type of cluster to run um, and how you should implement security and data governance. So this part is very important. Um, so I'd like to discuss technology choices into these five different layers of a data lake. So let's start with the storage. Um, the main storage for data lake is the Google Cloud Storage. Um, it has many features uh, listed over here, but most important ones are um, it has immediate consistency. When files and object has written to GCS, it's made immediately available for listing. So this part is very, very important for many Hadoop and Spark workloads. Um, it helps facilitate um, any transient or ephemeral clusters by separating the storage and compute. Um, there's no need for three times replication, such as in the HDFS, and you only need to pay for what you use. Um, more, a little bit more on GCS Connector. It's designed to support Hadoop ecosystem workload and working with the GCS. Um, it's transparent to users and applications, so you can use whatever format that you have. Um, it has improved to support for um, Parquet file format for analytic workloads. Um, we can simulate atomic uh, directory operations using corrective blocking. So there's a little bit more um, uh, technical details in the blog um, here below. So the best practice for um, running a storage. So small files has some problem for HDFS. It creates a pressure for name nodes. Um, but for GCS, too many like small files will result in like, too many round trips uh, through the network. So that adds up latency. Um, always use the new version of connectors to take advantage of the, the new uh, improvements. Uh, we're making them constantly. Um, align your Parquet file block size to two megabytes because that's what the GCS block size defaults to. Always partition your data to gain filtering benefits. Um, and regarding the migration, um, the CRC checksum are calculated differently uh, for HDFS and GCS for the same object. So um, we apply some changes to that to help you um, establish checksums. Uh, in order to use those, so make sure to use a Hadoop version that's newer than 2.9. Um, if you don't have the ability to upgrade cluster to a newer version, um, you can choose a, a workaround which uses MD5 checksum to move to a data prop cluster with HDFS first, then move those files to GCS. Um, regarding the migration tools, uh, this CP is the easiest way to move data into GCS. Um, if you have HBase or Cassandra um, on your cluster, um, you can consider move them to Cloud Bigtable. Um, Bigtable is a managed service. Um, it, it provides you managed replication. It's really easy to scale up. Um, it's fully compatible with HBase API. Um, it has a nice uh, data flow template to help you do bulk loading. Um, one, one of the um, exceptions, is if you're using Apache Phoenix, the data model is actually similar to a cloud spanner um, than cloud big table. So you can consider moving your data there if you want to use a managed tool for it. If you only use Hadoop for data warehouse use cases and dealing with only structured data or a little bit more semi-structured data, um, you can consider implementing your data lake using BigQuery plus BigQuery Storage. Um, BigQuery Storage API really treats data warehouse like a storage and allow you to use BigQuery like a data warehouse plus a data lake. So it integrates well with many, many tools um, in GCP and also open source ecosystems such as Apache Spark, Hive, TensorFlow, and many of the cloud AI products. So next part, we talk about the Metastore. Um, Hive Metastore is a service that stores metadata about Hive tables like schema and location and partitions in the relational database. Um, it's actually the de facto standard for many of the SQL engines on Hadoop 
and also the newer trend of table formats such as Delta Lake, Apache Iceberg, and Apache Hoodie. Um, having a centralized high meta store with data on GCS enable separate storage and compute further. Um, you can use multiple cluster operate on different Hive tables simultaneously. We just announced the alpha of Dataproc Metastore. It's actually a managed Hive Metastore. You can refer to the talk about that. So um, you can also map your BigQuery tables into Hive Metastore. Um, so you can use something like this and use the Spark BigQuery connector to read data from BigQuery. Next uh, is about ingestion layer. Um, many of you are using like maybe uh, Apache Flume, Apache Scoop, or uh, third-party tools for, for ingesting data into GCP. Um, Google actually offers a fully managed uh, open source um, tool called a Data Fusion. It's based on the uh, uh, tool of CDAP. Um, it's a fully managed code-free data ingestion service for building and managing data pipelines. Uh, it has pretty deep uh, GCP integrations with, with many types of sources and syncs. Um, if you prefer, you can still uh, continue to use Apache Flume and Scoop uh, with, together with Dataproc. Um, and it also supports many of the third-party tools like Talent or Informatica. Um, next, more about processing layer. Um, this is mostly based on your team skills. Um, we have, uh, you can choose from one of these two um, processing frameworks. So Dataproc is the managed Hadoop um, framework. So um, it has many of the open source um, data processing frameworks such as Spark, Flink, Hive, Pig, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Dataflow is a serverless framework um, using Apache Beam. So it's a different programming paradigm over there. So the best practice of choosing processing framework. Uh, when migrating, make sure um, you at least recompile your application uh, because you want to match the Java version, Spark, and Scala version to the Dataproc image uh, version that you have. For example, Dataproc 1.5 um, uses Scala 2.12 version of Spark. Um, so it's maybe different than, than the one you're using. Um, so at least recompile your application to validate that. Um, when you deploy the application on Dataproc, auto scaling is good. Uh, when you don't know the exact size of the cluster you, that you need. Um, but if you do know the job that we'll need um, more than X number of nodes, right? Then start with that. Don't just start with the auto scaling from a one node cluster. It will take a very long time to get there. Um, enhanced flexibility modes allow you to store shuffle data on HDF as a primary workload to avoid job failures and restarts when some of the nodes fail. Uh, you might want to consider use that. Um, E2 VMs and preemptible VMs are great for drive down the cost, um, but for pre preemptive VMs, um, you're having a risk of job failure or lose progress um, when the preemptive VMs goes away. Um, you can Dataproc Jobs API provides authorization, authentication, and auditing for jobs, so you can consider using that for um, submitting jobs to cluster. Next, we can talk about the data warehouse choice. Um, native GCP data warehouse is BigQuery, but you can always run open source query engines such as Hive, Presto, and others on Dataproc. Um, customer found the best value after migrating data warehouse to BigQuery, where you implement self-service data warehouse. BigQuery requires no operation. Um, it's, it is fully managed with flexible resource allocation and pricing model. It supports multiple file formats that you can find. Um, and be able to query them and ingest them into a BigQuery. So when migrating a database uh, to BigQuery, in many cases, we scope a BigQuery migration proof of concept, even if the first stage of migration is a lift and shift, just to demonstrate the values. Uh, the difference between the existing data warehouse and BigQuery may sound big at the beginning, but for processing and reporting of structured data, most of our customers found great value after POC and roll out to more users within two or three months, sometimes just in a matter of four to five weeks. So what makes the migration to BigQuery simple? Um, migration is not just uh, you know, migrating the storage and, uh, and the engine alone. 
Um, it also is not done until upstream and downstream pipeline components are identified and also migrated. So move to BigQuery is easy for most people because the connector exists for uh, very simple usage, such as uh, Spark and BigQuery connectors, high BigQuery storage handlers. For downstream consumptions, uh, BigQuery supports most of the BI tools via JDBC and ODBC. Uh, for many, um, BigQuery just simpler and better user experience. We'll see how uh, the security and data governance in the next few slides. Typically, you need Kerberos and Ranger to confidently secure a Hadoop data lake uh, or data warehouse. For BigQuery, it's all built in and integrated with IAM already. A couple of the best practices when migrating. Um, BigQuery supports data and integer range partitioning. Um, it supports clustering multiple columns. However, this is different than Hive. So if your Hive table is not partitioned by data or integer range, um, you, want rep, uh, you want to repartition and load the data to BigQuery. Uh, normally, you gain performance anyway, um, just to be sure. Um, BigQuery uses standard NC SQL. Um, there will be some minor differences for, for some of the functions, but largely um, it's compatible with most of the query. Uh, but like above, um, you can also, if your Hive uses complex partitioning strategy, uh, you may need to change those queries as well. Uh, the last, if you um, used to run high ETL at a very large scale, um, and you also like the BigQuery to do ETL, um, you can. it's better to do that in the dedicated project or a dedicated slots allocated pool um, than using you know, the same project or the same slots that serves ad hoc queries just to ensure um, a better user experience. So um, we have some customers want to you know, keep their data on premise and in other clouds while also using GCP. Um, and they also want to use one query engine and one set of scripts to avoid lock-ins or just create another silence, right? Um, in this case, you can actually use Presto for this. Um, it is easy to deploy Presto on Dataproc with the BigQuery connectors. Um, it actually, the connectors use the BigQuery storage API to provide you know, faster query results. Um, Presto has many con other connectors to, to talk to your, for example, uh, transactional data warehouse, um, your other um, enterprise data warehouse, even legacy Hadoop clusters. So next I wanna to touch on security and data governance. There are many types of identities in GCP. Uh, you're familiar with Google Identity, that's when you sign in. Uh, there are service accounts that represents the application. Let's see how that impacts security here. In a simple setup, in this case, each user has a distinct service account. Uh, and that person has a cluster use his and her service account. Um, these clusters have data inside GCS they, they need access to. So from GCS access log perspective, only service accounts access the GCS. Um, but you can look it up who actually did it because uh, the user and service account has mapping. Access control is only on bucket level. So you could use a conditional IM to uh, fine tune that. Um, if you use jobs API, you could find out which user actually submitted jobs through logging, but more on that later. In this setup with Kerberos, we're using a shared cluster. We we'll wanna make sure uh, user A um, is who they are. So user authenticated by Kerberos. So we can stop people from using the service that they don't have access to. Um, in the background, all the API calls are made by a service account of that cluster. So Dataproc with Kerberos will set up KDC on the master node, and KDC um, uses one-way trust across room trust to Active Directory. If user SSH to the cluster, uh, they will use their in Linux user um, to interact with Hadoop services. Before they do that, they need a K in it to get a Kerberos ticket. So when, when they access outside of the Dataproc cluster, um, it's actually used on the service account. BI tools in this case, if you're not using BigQuery, um, they will need to gain access to the Hive or Presto port um, to be able to you know, audit data access as human identity. Right? Previously, we talked about uh, from the access log perspective, it is the service account who access the GCS. 
um, we developed open source token broker and we presented it last year in the cloud next. Um, it will translate Kerberos principle to Google identity and call GCP APIs using that. So now you can control GCS data for individual user access. And the access control is still on the bucket level with the uh, conditional IAM um, possible. If you want a table level access control, then you need to use Apache Ranger. So for authorization management on data lake, uh, let's take a look at what capacity uh, capabilities are available in GCP. On file system level, on-premise HDFS uses POSIX permissions. Um, you can continue to use that on for HDFS on GCP, but the HDFS um, comes with the data practice only for temporary storage. So it's more important to look at GCS access control. For now, GCS only has bucket level access control. Um, like I said earlier, conditional IMs are available with prefix settings. Um, but the purpose is not really just to find green access control to uh, each object level. So there's a limited number of conditions you can apply. On the SQL engine side, on-premise, um, we usually use Apache Ranger for restricting a certain user, um, tables, or columns. On GCP, you can continue to use Ranger um, if you want to continue to use open source SQL engines such as Hive and Presto, et cetera. Um, if you migrate your enterprise data warehouse to BigQuery, BigQuery natively, provide access control on data set level, table level, column level, um, and row level. These um, couple of the later features are available in beta right now. Another level of access control is service access control. For example, which Hadoop user or, or sorry, which Hadoop service or UI that user can access to. This is typically done by either Hue or use Apache Knox. Um, on Dataproc, you can uh, use Apache Knox gateway to do that. So first, let's uh, take a look at how Dataproc Jobs API can solve this authorization problem to some extent. While user A submits a job, logs will show who actually submitted the job. And GCS will still show um, it's a service account access the data. However, um, external BI application doesn't really speak uh, Jobs API, so they can um, only connect to the unsecured connection to the to the cluster. So in a more complicated setup with Ranger, um, let's just see how Ranger solved the granular access control. So Ranger can be started as a data proc optional component um, to use in a large production system. You might want to consider centralized Ranger service um, so it can be deployed on GCE with a um, Cloud SQL as the backend database. Ranger provides database, table, and column level access control for Hive Server 2. Um, any request that goes through Hive Server 2 will be checked and authorized by Ranger. Um, this will apply to BI tools that connect through Hive. Um, Hive also has plugin um, with Presto. So uh, the same thing if you BI to connect to with Presto, Ranger can also uh, solve that. Ranger does not sync permission to cloud storage like it did for HDFS. Um, to avoid this issue, uh, you can have a cluster that only provides uh, SQL service with Ranger to secure access so people don't um, circumvent that. As mentioned before, Apache Knox can help control service access such as allow and deny access to Yarn UI or Hue UI, maybe something else. It adds access control for cluster used by BI tools instead of letting BI tool to connect to the ports of Hive or Presto or something else. It passes user identity to the cluster, so Ranger can also apply user-based authentication authorization even without Kerberos. Um, next, we talk about metadata management tasks. Um, to make things work together with open source big data tools, there are some solutions here. GCP offers data catalog, which catalogs data from BigQuery PubSub natively. Um, it also has a set of connector to import catalog data from high Metastore and other um, systems. Data Fusion provides a way to standardize data processing with native, with native tools, provided data lineage. Uh, for open source components, Apache Atlas can provide um, those sort of lineage from that. Um, Apache Atlas and Data Catalog both provides a way to tag and search your data. Um, automatically categorize data and mask them are crucial to processing sensitive data. 
So Google's Data Loss Prevention API and Apache Atlas both provide a way to categorize data and mask them when necessary. So more on Apache Atlas that provides um, data lineage, classification, access control, working together with Apache Ranger, um, and also discovery capabilities. It works with most of the open source components. Um, it also has integration with the third-party tool like Colibra. So here's a way how you can quickly create a new cluster to test out the uh, Apache Atlas without affecting other workloads. So some of the best practices uh, when we come to security and data governance. Application uh, has like predefined behavior. So these are usually uh, in the form of batch or streaming workloads. Um, they could be long running or they could be scheduled. Uh, these are not ad hoc jobs. So there's no really human interaction in them. So normally we can trust them running and grant the minimum permission to the service account they're running. So you know how to trace back to them. For data warehouse, it is mostly ad hoc queries for user uh, for these use cases, right? Uh, most users will just uh, query, you know, send SQL queries through Hive and Palo others. Um, we re although we recommend using BigQuery to simplify this. Um, but if you do need to run, um, have you know, run open source data warehouse such as Hive or Presto, um, you can just use Ranger to secure them. For a third type, uh, which we call exploratory workloads. Um, they're such as maybe a data scientist use uh, PySpark to profile data and build model. Um, you can set up data prop cluster with Jupyter Notebooks um, for the personal clusters or a team clusters, provided you can uh, control access of that service account. Um, if that doesn't fit, right, you will say you want to share the cluster with a, a few more people, um, then you can use Kerberos together with open source token broker. So let's talk about a little bit about hybrid and multi-cloud scenarios because um, I hear this uh, more often these days. If you really think about it, um, hybrid scenarios are pretty common. So every um, data migration has a hybrid stage where some of your data and jobs are migrated, some are not. Um, to a common scenario, first, uh, you need to have very good you know, interconnect. Uh, because you need to move data or jobs uh, through you know, both environments all the time. Um, full DNS resolution, it's important uh, if you bi-directional communication is needed, and um, it's crucial for Kerberos to work too. And then um, use a very powerful orchestration tool like Apache Airflow or Composer to launch tasks in all these different environments. Um, our customer typically like to choose one tool to control all the environment and be able to launch job to all the environments. So make sure you have a discovery service that routes the workload to the correct cluster um, based on the request. If you don't feel like cop making copies of data to different environments, um, some of the zero copy solution like Luxio could be a good fit for that. Okay, so. That concludes my talk. To recap, we went through high-level migration principles of open, integrated, and safe. Rules of migration, um, such as establish clear priorities, timeline, separating storage and compute, and rethink about operations. Then we dive into the tech stack choice. Um, we talk about storage choice of GCS, BigQuery storage, and Cloud Big Table. Um, data fusion for ingestions, data proc, and data flow for processing layer. For data warehouse layer, we discuss the choice of Hive, Presto, and BigQuery, and what impact to consider when moving them to BigQuery, and how to solve federated environment query challenge with data proc and Presto. And then we talk about how to secure and govern data lakes. Um, we talk about Kerberos authentications, what's the impact on data access and auditing, um, how to authorize data using Kerberos Ranger, um, Jobs API, and Apache and Knox. Um, BigQuery actually does a very good job in solving those um, access control challenges. Um, so definitely, it's a preferred way of running data warehouse on GCP. Um, last, we discuss Apache Atlas and uh, data catalog for data governance tasks. Um, so that's pretty much it. 
Um, thanks for joining my talk.